Hey everyone, Ashton here, and welcome back to Precision Horology. Today we're going to be looking at part two of our Patek Philippe backwind disassembly. Uh, the Patek Philippe Caliber 350, uh, we took care of the uh, initial inspection in the previous video, and now we're going to look at the um, disassembly process. So, let's get started. Now the first thing we need to do is we need to remove our peripheral winding rotor. Now, normally I wouldn't uh, advise um, holding a watch with your hands or a movement with your hands to undo something, but because of the way this rotor is connected or this oscillating weight is connected, um, it's gonna be very important that we uh, take care not to damage it or not to um, harm the harm the oscillating weight in any way, which is why we're not going to put it in a movement holder. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold the movement between my fingers like this, and then I'm gonna unscrew our three screws that hold our peripheral winding weight on. Like I said, I wouldn't normally recommend that you repair a watch like this um, but because of the delicate nature of the back wind feature and the fact that you know I'm not equipped with vintage 1970s Patek movement holders uh, this is going to be the safest way uh, to proceed uh, and to dismantle this watch so that we can repair it now the movement is going to want to fall, but we have the movement with our fingers and finger cots, so we can just hold it, and we can place the movement down. So there we can see our peripheral winding rotor. Now it has some seriously beautiful action there. Look at that, that is that is nice. Big fan of that. We can check our bearings. We can see that our bearings are still good. We don't have too much play in there. So that's good. So now that we've got that oscillating weight removed, we can get to servicing the movement, or sorry, dismantling the movement. Now what we want to do as we go is we want to have a little look at our end shakes to make sure our end shakes are okay. So we just check to see if they're good. We're also going to check these afterward because it's when we have old lubrication and we have um, uh, gummed up lubrication, whatever it may be, it can affect our end shakes. Um, but it's good to just have a, an initial check just to see how we're traveling uh, and make sure everything's working as it should. Have a look at our balance spring briefly, make sure it's flat and centered. And again, we'll do this afterward uh, because it's important to do it afterward so we can see the balance spring um, from every position. Whereas in this position, it's, uh, it's difficult to see the balance spring. So what we'll do at this point is I like to leave the, um, uh, the inker blocks in place um, and we deal with them afterwards. So I'm going to remove... the balance cock with the balance and screw. And the safest way to remove the balance, which I believe I've been through before, is like so. We're not digging around underneath 
um, we're not poking under there, we're not prodding, we're not uh, messing with the balance spring. So that is the safest way to turn it upside down and tap to remove the balance. Have a look at the staff, the staff looks good. And we'll, while we're dismantling the rest of our watch, we'll safely put our balance and our movement tray over to the side. Check our end shakes of our pallet fork and of our escape wheel. At this stage, we can. Remove our pallet cock screws, I guess. Just a small residual amount of power there in the train that was released. Put our pallet cock to the side and we'll inspect our pallet fork. Or anywhere. It seems to be okay. There's just one area of concern that I'm going to have a look at. Use the rotico to just clean them off so that we can see what's old lubricant and what's damage. We've got no damage to our stones. Can check our horns for wear. And we look okay. And now we can get to removing our train bridge. With our train bridge removed, if we closely examine it, we can see as the light shines on it there, quite a lot of lubrication. Um, now, this indicates to me that the watch possibly was serviced recently, um, but mixed in with that lubrication, we can see a lot of dirt and a lot of grime. Uh, I can even see a hair on that on that center seconds wheel, um, uh, not center seconds wheel, fourth wheel. Um, so we can see that uh, it may have been serviced recently, but uh, I would say there's a far too much lubrication there um, on those train wheels. So we can now see that we have our barrel bridge removed. Um, we now have access to our center wheel or our seconds wheel. Uh, our barrel here, uh, and we can see our um, winding system, uh, which is what our crown attaches to. So our crown would just uh, would just sit on top there. Uh, very interesting little way of doing it. Um, interesting way of winding up the uh, the winding pinion. So we can actually remove that. And we can see that we have a wheel on there. And this is our winding pinion teeth. And that's the way that we wind up the crown wheel. Um, we'll explain it in more detail once we actually uh, get these train wheel pivots out. Um, and we can, we can examine it further. So let's remove our train wheels 
and we'll put them aside for inspection. Um, later, not now, uh, because I'm very interested in seeing, uh, and I'm sure you are too, of how this winding system works underneath the barrel here. So here we see our ratchet wheel underneath our barrel sitting here, which the square of our barrel arbor bears into. Then we have our, I guess it's kind of like a winding pinion, or it's a two-part winding pinion that attaches here. And then we have an intermediate wheel with what seems to be a wheel and a pinion that engages with our ratchet wheel. And as that engages with our ratchet wheel, it in turn transfers the energy or the power to wind up our mainspring through the barrel arbor. So now let's take a look at our automatic bridge. Let's remove our automatic bridge um, and see how that all works together with the barrel. Well, with our automatic bridge removed, we can see uh, our winding wheels that help to transfer power. We can see that we have a wheel here that's sprung loaded from this small spring here. And we can see that it moves back and forth and it's held here by a shouldered screw. If we remove this wheel in our train, uh, winding train, we can see that it engages with a smaller wheel and pinion, or another wheel and pinion, which almost mirrors the similar style, the same style as the wheel that comes off uh, our ratchet wheel um, and, our, and our winding pinion. We can even see that um, it uses the same small bridge and screw to hold it in place as, uh, as our wheel over there. Um, uh, and if we follow the gear train, remove this wheel first. Those two have come out together. It's uh, certainly an interesting doubled uh, coaxial wheel there. If we follow the train, we can see that we have a click here, and that click is engaged with a small spring underneath. And all this power is transferred via this guy here. Uh, which is a wheel which transfers the power from the peripheral rotor, or the peripheral winding mechanism, through our automatic winding train into our mainspring to power the watch uh, and drive the hands forward. So let's remove the rest of this automatic work. So we now have the majority of our automatic winding work and manual winding work removed. A couple of interesting features here. To remove this wheel, uh, we have a small uh, bridge that comes across or a small clip. So we need to unscrew this screw. Um, we have a similar screw and clip system over here uh, for our um, uh, crown wheel or our uh, winding pinion. Uh, and then we need to remove our main center wheel, which is driven off the barrel. Uh, again, removing this small bridge here um, to, to release all of that. Uh, we can now see that everything is removed from our main plate. Interestingly, when I remove the screw that holds in this piece, um, which is holding our main uh, wheel in, 
which transfers power from the oscillating weight to the, the train there. Um, the screw was loose. Uh, it, was, it was coming undone, so that's, uh, that's something that's good. We spotted that. Uh, make sure that, that uh, our screws are always done up nice and tight um, before, we, before we proceed with the next step. We also want to really be really careful with our springs. We have our various click springs over here. We have two, there's one sitting here and one sitting here. These can't be removed uh, and they're very specially shaped. So we need to make sure that when we put the watch through the cleaner that the movement is safe uh, and we're gonna have no damage. That's why we can't bunch a whole bunch of parts together. Uh, we need to keep things separate uh, to make sure nothing gets damaged. Now traditionally, there's a lot more going on on the dial side of a watch. Um, dial side of an automatic watch. Here we see, once we've removed the hour wheel and cannon pinion uh, that we did before we stripped the movement, uh, we just have one single little bridge here holding on um, our, our minute wheel. That's because of the way the watch is wound and set, because it's a back wind uh, and back set. We don't have all this um, uh, work underneath the dial here. Uh, we have it, uh, and, and we just have this one screw uh, and wheel to remove. Uh, so we'll do that, uh, and then we'll put the balance back on the watch. So stay tuned for part two, where we will look at the assembly and lubrication of the watch. Well, thanks for joining me today, and don't forget to subscribe to be notified about when the next video will be released. Feel free to leave a comment and share with your friends. Thanks again, guys, and see you next time.